All right, hey everyone, and thank you for joining our presentation today. I'm Chris Hines, a product marketing manager here at Docker, and today we're joined with a special guest um, from Expedia, Kuldeep Chauhan. So, Kuldeep, thanks for being here. Um, oh, go ahead. I think you're going to say something. <laughs> no, no, I was just saying hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Yeah, I'll let you continue. Sure, awesome. So today we're going to talk about how Expedia is leveraging Docker and specifically Docker Trusted Registry to help revolutionize travel. So um, just a, a few quick things before I kick things off. Um, first off, this presentation is being recorded, so you'll have the opportunity to uh, give it another listen if you'd like. What we'll do is we'll follow up with you all later on this week. We'll send out a follow-up email and include the link to this recording within it, and you can share it with anyone that you'd like. Um, also, towards the end of this presentation, we'll make sure we save about 10 or 12 minutes or so to, um, for Q&A. So if you have questions, feel free to ask them throughout the presentation by posting them within um, the portal here in WebEx. You'll notice there's a little Q&A um, section. Feel free to utilize that at any point. All right? So uh, first off, uh, before we get into actually how Expedia is using DTR, what I want to do is first share some insights. All right, so um, we uh, did a survey in Q1 2016 of this year called the State of Application Development Survey, and the whole goal was to understand how Docker is being utilized in the enterprise and to understand the common challenges that enterprises face. Um, so we found that the three major kind of driving forces that enterprises are going with today, and I'm sure a lot of you on this um, webinar actually experiencing our um, the move to microservices, right? So we call this modernizing applications, right? Taking these monolithic applications and lifting them up, them up and breaking them into microservices by leveraging Docker containers. Uh, we've seen about three out of four of the top initiatives revolve around um, breaking these applications into microservices. Um, another key initiative is the cloud, right? So moving to the cloud. Um, We've seen about 80% of people are using Docker, view it as a, a central to their cloud strategy. And then last, we have DevOps, right, breaking down that traditional barrier that has existed between um, both developer teams and operations teams and um, building out a platform that both can leverage so that IT has control and so that your developers are able to build their applications but in a self-service manner, okay? So that's why we've introduced something called Docker Containers as a Service, right? our Docker Cast platform. You might have heard about this. Um, essentially what it's doing is it's providing um, a, a framework, right? a Containers as a Service framework, and it delivers tools that IT operations teams need to actually control and manage their environment, while at the same time enabling developers to actually go and build applications but do it in a self-service way. right? So IT has control, and your developers have flexibility and portability. So here's a quick look at, at Docker Data Center. I know this um, presentation is specific around Docker Trusted Registry, but I think it's important to kind of view the overall context and as to how DTR fits into this overall platform. Um, so here's Docker Data Center. Uh, it's an on-premises solution that delivers um, a containers as a service environment. Okay, so you have the Docker engine, Right, it's, it's called the, uh, the CS engine or the commercially supported engine. It's the main runtime, and now we have uh, built-in orchestration with a release of 112, um, networking, volumes, plugins, you have it. And then, of course, Docker Trusted Registry, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. But DTR is an on-premises registry that, al that enables um, IT teams to store and secure their image content, while at the same time provide secure collaboration for anyone who's actually interacting with that um, that image content as well. And then there's the universal control plane, uh, which you might be familiar with. It's essentially the management layer of Docker Data Center. It's the thing that enables you to build clusters and then uh, manage, deploy, and orchestrate your applications across your actual entire um, environment. And then we have security, which of course is a super, super important aspect of it, especially when you look at um, enterprise IT operations teams. All right, so we have tools like Content Trust, right? So if you need to actually go out and sign images and ensure that um, the publisher or, or that there's no one who's actually going out and, and tampering with that content, um, we have things like uh, role-based access controls, um, so or our back for shirts, so you can actually um, control who has access to what information at specified levels, right? So you can give people like no view, or you can give them admin so they can see everything. 
and then things like LDAP and AD, right? So for that um, that user experience, we can easily um, plug into an LDAP or AD server, pull down your team, uh, create teams and organizations quite easily, and then apply those role-based access controls to them. Um, we also realize that enterprises have already existed or invested in existing infrastructure, whether that be um, virtualization infrastructure, whether that be physical or converged. So this is built to be extremely pluggable, right? DTR is meant to be pluggable. So it can be deployed in um, the virtual private cloud. It can be deployed in our physical converged infrastructure as well. And we built it to be pluggable, right? So we have those plugins that you see at the top around CICD. Um, so I know Kaldeep will talk about how he's kind of plugging with some of the um, CICD tools that are out there. Um, images, obviously for storing images, networking volumes, config, et cetera, right? And the engine itself, um, the thing that actually creates and runs these containers is able to be deployed um, in any environment. So it's completely flexible, right? So public cloud, um, if you're leveraging a public cloud provider or uh, virtualization, let's say you're leveraging a, a VMware, or physical garbage infrastructure like um, like a Nutanix or an EMC. Okay, so um, my last slide here, I promise if I like Kaldeep get in here <laughs> and discuss um, kind of how he's using DTR at Expedia. Um, so just a quick overview of DTR. Um, again, like I said, it's an on-premises solution for storing and securing image content. Um, some of the key features, and I know Kaldeep will kind of talk about this in his own kind of um, in the context of Expedia, um, but you have things like granular user management, right? So the single sign-on, the role-based access controls, the teams and orgs that I that I mentioned, um, the resource management, so garbage collection of any um, orphaned images. Are you think about images who are out there that you might not be leveraging anymore, but they're consuming your resources. Um, with garbage collection, you're actually able to provide a hard delete and actually get back CPU and um, valuable resources. Okay. And then there's obviously the security and compliance aspect. Um, some of you might be in regulated industries and you have to maybe comply with, you know, um, PCI compliance or HIPAA compliance, right? This provides an on-premises solution, right, where, where you can actually go into and, and look at audit logs and understand who's doing what within DTR. You have the image signing as well um, with Docker Content Trust. Okay. So at this point, what I'd like to do is actually transition over to Kaldi. So Kaldi, what I'll do is let me stop sharing, and I will pass the ball over to you. All you have to do is just uh, click the drop-down arrow in the middle of the screen and share either your desktop or your application, depending on um, what you'd like to share first. Can you, hear, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, and I'm looking at Docker Trusted Registry. Okay, maybe uh, I think I don't have the link open for the uh, uh, slide deck. Maybe you can present for the time being. Yeah, and sure. I want to switch back. I will switch back. Sure. So let me actually uh, let me take back control real quickly. I'll share the deck, and then you can um, let's see. And you can just talk through and tell me when to to push on to the next slide. Sure. All right. Yep. Uh, thanks, Chris, for the introduction. Um, uh, hello, everyone. I'm Kuldeep Chauhan, uh, my principal engineer at Expedia. Um, I've been working at Expedia for the last uh, three and a half years now, uh, primarily working on the cloud space. Again, uh, Docker is, as uh, Chris mentioned, a lot of uh, enterprises are looking uh, at Docker as well in their cloud journey. Uh, prior to working at Expedia, I have worked at uh, Shell Oil and Gas in Houston, and then before that, I worked at Microsoft um, in the same Seattle area. Uh, today, as Chris mentioned, I'm going to talk about how we use Docker Trusted Registry and how Docker in general has been helping us um, in our uh, cloud journey. Um, as, as we walk through, uh, we'll talk about those details and um, uh, we'll also have a short demo of how we use. Uh, a Docker uh, Trusted Registry in our CI/CD uh, workflow. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, I, I've, I'm from Expedia. I'm, I'm, I represent brand Expedia among all these brands that you see. So Expedia INC, like as a whole, is all these brands that you see out there. Um, but I am I represent brand Expedia, uh, which which is one of the uh, biggest 
sites across all those brands. As you see, we have Hotels.com, Orbit, Travelocity, Car Rentals, uh, What If, and, and the list goes on. Uh, Expedia was uh, founded 20 years ago. Uh, and again, as over the years, it has gone through multiple phases, and then we have acquired a lot of brands. Um, we have about 200 uh, travel booking sites across uh, 75 countries. Uh, it, it, and then about the uh, the revenue actually comes mostly from all these sites that I mentioned. Uh, but the, the number of sites that we have is about 200, which are different points of sale, or in general, the brands itself, that how they are uh, operating. And we are about 18,000 uh, employees across the globe. Uh, we have offices, even the, the big offices, like at least seven or different places in the world, and there are like so many small offices as well. Um, again, uh, I'll go back, but again, that, that's fine. I'll talk about our our mission is to uh, uh, revolutionize the um, travel through power of technology. Um, we are passionate about travel. We do travel a lot, and we also want to help customers get the best experience. Um, using uh, technology, so that's that's our mission. That's what we want to help customers get on uh, onto our platform. But again, I think all these doesn't need a lot of introduction because a lot of people already know Expedia. Um, if you're if you're not using Expedia, I'm sure you're missing out on a lot of good deals that are there on Expedia sites. Uh, with that, I'll uh, talk about our journey, uh, how we have started using Docker. Um, so again, we have been trying to use Docker for the last two years, um, which is always in our back burner to go and see uh, what is Docker, how do we use Docker for our services um, that we have. And then uh, actually, really, we started having a lot of push late last year um, to, to use Docker. Um, again, as I mentioned, we have been around for some time now. There's definitely a lot of uh, Big big applications that we have, uh, big big monolith applications that we have been running for a while. Um, over like four years ago, uh, we started our journey into cloud, uh, predominantly AWS. Um, and then at that time, we started to see what does it take to actually go and deploy into AWS. And then we also started to look at microservice architecture uh, rather than big uh, big monolith. Set monolith application that we were running. So we started deploying to AWS, it's all fine, but again, as, as we starting to uh, get more into microservices, then we started to look at Docker, and then last year, as I mentioned, we started to look more into using Docker for our services. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit Primer later on, uh, but Primer is something that we built internally uh, for teams that who are trying to deploy to AWS or migrate to AWS. Um, help them to either create, uh, earlier we were using Chef, so uh, to create Chef cookbooks, all the infrastructure configs. Um, later on, we have, now we are, our drive is to get our microservices deployed through Docker. So basically, Primer helps teams to uh, create a base image and then a base Docker file, which uses for like, I, I talk through different types of templates that we support as well, like ExpressJS, Spring Boot, Spring MVC, like a whole lot of templates that we support. Um, but what help, Primer helps teams to, is to basically do a bootstrap and kickstart their development process. And then it also creates a CICD workflow for them. Um, and we have about 200 apps that are actually running in, in production right now, taking traffic, uh, running in AWS as Docker containers. Um, again, we, we, as I mentioned, AWS, we are spread across the globe. Not all of, we, we also have our data center. So we also have to keep that in mind where uh, it's it's not that we can just migrate, not migrate, but move everything out. So we are continue to actually to deploy to our data center as well um, with the help of Docker. So that's where Docker really helps us in both the aspects. We'll, we'll talk more about it in the next slides. And you want to go to the next slide, Chris? So on a very high level, these are the ones that we really use. Um, 
of, of the uh, slide that Chris showed earlier. Um, Docker engine is heavily used. We have about, um, I would say more than 100 hosts or maybe 150 hosts, close to maybe 150 hosts um, that are running in Amazon, which are using Docker engine uh, to, to run the uh, Docker containers. And as, as focus of this topic, uh, the trusted registry, uh, we have been using trusted registry right out of when uh, Docker released it last year. Um, I think it's close to a year now, or maybe uh, like few more months, it will, uh, it will become a year. Uh, but right after Docker released trusted registry, we started using, prior to that, we were using the, um, the open source Docker registry and then uh, then we are also using some uh, Docker container which provided a UI. Um, again, uh, we, we tried multiple things with the trusted registry. We started, uh, when I said tried, is the backend, um, but it, it, it has maybe more than 1,000 repos now. Uh, some of them we have, may have to go and clean up, but it's, we started with different backends. We started with S3, we tried with EFS, we have been using EBS now. But in general, that is where we store all our images that uh, that are required either to be deployed into the data center or into the into AWS. So that's our uh, and also not only just one environment in AWS, we do use it to deploy to multiple environments and multiple uh, regions as well um, in Amazon. Uh, Docker Compose uh, teams are using on their uh, uh, like laptops to do their dev environment setups. Um, there, there are few places where we do use Docker Compose with uh, Docker Swarm to deploy, um, but predominantly Docker Compose is is, a, is something that teams actually use um, on their local laptops uh, to set up their local environments. Because most of, as, as I mentioned earlier, it is a microservice architecture. It is not a monolith, so people need to run multiple services to bring their uh, service up. That's where Docker Compose helps uh, teams to do that. Um, and then we do deploy to AWS and also to data center. Um, and we talk a trusted registry being our uh, source where we actually push our images and then download them from uh, whether it is in AWS or data center. Um, ne next slide, Chris. Yep. Um, uh, as Chris also mentioned earlier, we definitely would. Um, we are definitely interested to have authentication, right? Like, not interested, but that's a requirement for us where we need to have authentication to our registries. Uh, we don't want to have full access for anyone to our registries. So uh, definitely the integration that we get uh, with trusted registry with our Active Directory on-prem uh, Active Directory that we have um, that and, and also we have the option to assign roles. So we have and then an admin role where only few people from the cloud engineering team has access to either create repos, um, like when I say create repos, not for, um, not the team specific, like the user specific repos. The user specific repos, I can go and create it anytime after I log in. Um, but in general, we have these roles where we have admin role and then we also have like a read, a read write role. Um, and then all these are controlled by Active Directory uh, security groups. So we don't have to manage one more layer of uh, groups in, uh, let's say, in, in registry and then add people to it. Rather, we actually manage it our, uh, at our Active Directory level where we, we go and add people to different uh, security groups and then they get synchronized with uh, um, with, it, uh, with the Docker Trusted Registry. And um, of course, Docker Trust Registry gives us a place to store um, our images. Um, that way, that where we can go and deploy either um, in our local laptops or in AWS or in uh, in data center. Um, I, I think more than why Docker Trusted Registry, I would also try to uh, like maybe add a couple of more points here. The biggest benefit that I think most of you might have already know this, but is the ability that you have the same environment uh, that your app is running, whether you whether you are running on on your local laptop or whether you are running in uh, production. 
it, it, the, the words were as well, right? Like where you have a Docker image that's running in production and you want to debug that version, all you have to do is just do a Docker pull uh, of that particular Docker image on your local laptop, and then uh, you can start looking at what's wrong with the app or do uh, debugging, whatnot. But the consistency of uh, deploying um, everywhere in the same manner is what definitely something that we really like about Docker. Um, we, we, uh, most of the times when people talk about deploying to different environments, be consistent, uh, be consistent across all environments, it typically starts from the test environment and goes all the way to production. Most of the time, the dev environment is where uh, you don't get that benefit. Um, with Docker, that's that's one of the benefits we definitely see that it's not only just we start at the test environment, but you also get at the dev environment as well, where your, your local laptop is also running the same way as your production. Next one. Yeah, so this is the one that I mentioned earlier about um, uh, what Primer does and how people actually use Primer and what Primer gives them. Um, I'll, I'll walk through this later uh, in my short demo. Uh, the, the use case here with the Primer is where it's, just, it's the same process you repeat over and over and over. So let's say you are deploying your Express J, like X, X, Node.js Express um, application to AWS. You probably most of the time it is the same thing apart from like you have to the de I'm talking about the deployment process more not more about the application right like the application you it could vary twenty different types but typically you have a package dot json where you go and install like run npm install and then it installs the pack packages and then you do an npm start on a very high level that's typically the process that most of the Node.js apps follow, right? So what Primer does is um, you have an idea that you want to create a new application, microservice, then how do you get that deployed to AWS in this case, right? So you go to a page, you enter some details saying that this is my app name, this is my like my contact details, this is my, uh, we use HipChat a lot, um, this, is, this is the room that where I want to see the notifications to come in and then you click on hey, create the app. So what it does is it goes and creates a GitHub repo for you. Um, we use GitHub Enterprise uh, internally. So it goes, it goes and creates a repo. Then we also have a sample uh, source code, which is basically a hello world version of Node.js combined with Express. It creates that and then it also creates a Docker file, uh, which and then we, we have base Docker images that we create like similar to what you see of like uh, uh, outside where you have like you do from Java or from Node, right? What we did is we actually did from Node, we, we added all the stuff that we care from the perspective of um, um, Brand Expedia. And then we have a central repo that we use, like a central image that we use for all the Node.js apps. So we, we create a Docker file and refer saying that, hey, get that uh, base Docker image for me. And then we also create uh, CICD jobs so that we can go and deploy, uh, sorry, when a change happens, it triggers Jenkins to do the build. And uh, like when I say build, like if you have tests, it runs an NPM test, and then make sure it, the NPM install works and then goes and creates a Docker image and then pushes that to the uh, Docker trusted registry. And the other parts that I have here are basically the parts that we automatically create them for for them as well. Like where we use Splunk for our logging, so it creates a Splunk configuration information for the app. Then we also use Graphite for our metrics, so it creates a template so that the metrics from the app can go to uh, Graphite. Uh, so this is very high level what Primer does. Um, maybe next go to the next one. Talk about ETR. Right, so the, the same place where I mentioned where we, we create a Docker file. Um, so what happens when on a typical uh, on a typical workflow is when a developer checks in his changes to uh, source control, which in our in our case is GitHub Enterprise. We use um, webhooks that configured between Git and um, Jenkins, which triggers the Jenkins job. 
Jenkins job does whatever is defined in the build section, then it creates an image and then that image gets pushed to the Docker registry. And then we have another Jenkins to go and actually deploy that uh, Docker image to um, AWS. Um, I'll probably, and I think next up is a demo, if I'm not wrong, Chris. Um, I'll maybe switch into a demo more. No, okay. So yeah, this is just the UI, which I'll also show later on. Um, uh, this is where our base, base Docker images are. And uh, as, as I mentioned, we, uh, we are heavily deploying into AWS. So even the Docker registry that we have, uh, the, the Docker Trust registry is also hosted in Amazon. And the automated push to the uh, Jenkins job, it gets pushed to the uh, Docker Trust registry through Jenkins and uh, all, all open source Docker, uh, Docker plugin that Jenkins has. Um, let me go to the next one. Um, yeah, so th this is how our base Docker image uh, for Node.js looks like, right? Um, as I mentioned, we get from the Node, official Node version uh, uh, 6.2, and then we install Daminet. Um, and then th these are something that we care for our creating, um, like where the log should go, where the artifact get, should call, get copied over when it runs npm install. And then when we also use on build, um, uh, on on build to create our Docker images on the uh, on the source uh, repo. Uh, I'll I'll show these things and then we also have an entry point shell script that that's the typical uh, format that we use. Uh, every type of app that we support has an entry point uh, shell script that we follow in the same manner. Um, uh, next up, to the... okay. Maybe I think we, we will come back to this slide. I'll do it uh, walk through, uh, Chris. Yeah, let me, um, here, I'll stop sharing and I'll pass you the ball so you can share your screen. Sure. Um, can you see my screen? Yep, looking at DTR. Okay. okay, sure. So I think this is the one that I mentioned earlier, right? Like as, as a developer, all I have to do is, this is primary dashboard. All I have to do is log into this dashboard, say I want a Node.js app. There are different types of apps that we support. You can see that these are the different types of apps we support. And then we say, uh, what is the app name? So I went ahead and created an app this morning uh, as Docker webinar. And then I gave some details here for tracking purposes. Uh, what ends up happening is basically this repo that gets created internal to our Docker uh, in, in our GitHub enterprise. And uh, again, this is all Hello World applications. That is, there is nothing fancy here. Um, as I mentioned, this is what the, the, the Docker file for the application repo looks like. Um, there is nothing here with, like everything is already taken care in the in this base Docker image um, because we are using that on build uh, for both copying the artifacts into the image and running npm install. Uh, we really don't have to even run those, uh, specify that command. So we just use the on build uh, in the Docker, uh, in the base Docker image. Right, so um, this is one, right, like this is the Docker registry that get, uh, sorry, Docker, the GitHub repo that gets created. And then as I mentioned, we do create Jenkins jobs for them automatically. So like we, we do create two jobs, one of them is master, um, and then one of them is all. All basically, typically any branch that you have um, in the GitHub repo, we'll go and build it. And for master, um, so master is only specific to that master branch. Um, one thing to note here, um, we follow GitHub flow, not Git flow. So master is our main branch where we, we want to continuously deploy from master. So that's the reason you see a master here and every other branch, we just treat it as all branches. Um, logging into Jenkins. And then a few other things that um, we'll, I'll come back and do a demo, like how we change and how it gets pushed. Um, right, so this is our Docker registry, Docker trusted registry. Um, the homepage, as you can see, we have I have to log in to get into it. Um, I'm, I'm going to log in with my Active Directory credentials. Um, so once I'm logged in because I'm an admin, 
I, I get to see uh, the admin section. Um, there is also a read write uh, role that we have that a developer can join. And all this is controlled by Active, Di uh, Active Directory Security Groups as mentioned earlier. Um, where is the path? No, so this is the admin group um, where you have to be part of that admin group to get access to the uh, registry. So that's how we control it. To, to who gets admin and who doesn't get admin. Um, as part of the uh, primer app creation, uh, what happens is a Docker repo is also created for them automatically. You can see that we have a Docker repo that was automatically created. No one actually went and created this repo. Uh, so you can see that library slash Docker webinar has been created uh, for this particular app type. As a user, you can create your own repos, right? Like as a user, this is some other user who created his own um, namespace in the registry, so he can push for that. But all our deployments that happen into AWS, they they only look usually they only look at library, right? So that's the reason you see that we have we have it like this, um, and then the tag which which I'll show again is basically you get a build the build. Uh, uh, the Jenkins job that creates the Docker image and then pushes to the registry. Um, yeah, I can change uh, to private or public, uh, but anyways, all of them are authenticated. You have to authenticate to get to this part. Um, and let's see if I can go back to here. Um, this is the Jenkins job that I mentioned um, that gets created part of the primer. Um, in this we have this uh, Docker plugin that we use in Jenkins to do a uh, to do a Docker build and then we do a publish, right? So this is the uh, registry URL where we actually publish and all our Jenkins slaves have the credentials. Um, there is also credentials that are stored on the box um, so that the Docker, uh, after the Docker build, if done, it is pushed to the registry. Um, but this is like again, it is using the base Docker image that I mentioned here. Um, the Docker file, it is just using this Docker file and it's creating um, the Docker image and pushing it. Uh, one quick note here um, so this, we also have a repo, we call it as Docker, um, where we have all our base Docker images. So this is basically are the ones that we use to go and deploy to uh, different types of templates that I showed earlier. So what each one of them is supported where we create a Docker image for different types of apps that Primer creates, and that's the one that gets used. So if I go back here and then search for, um, um, right, so if I do, um, like example that I was showing here earlier, uh, the Finatra one, right, like you can see that we had a, uh, Finatra one here, right, so that gets pushed, and then you can see that you have these tags that are associated for that particular type of app. Similarly, there are others that we have, but these are like the base base that people are using. Um, of course, people can create their own, or there is a library pattern that we follow for every microservice that gets created. So this is the ExpressJS one that I was trying to show, and then you can see there are different versions that we started, we was doing very old, and when the Node.js came to 4, we started using 4, now we are using 6.2. Um, I'll dip, go through a work uh, workflow and just show what typically happens. Um, so this is the same repo that I showed you earlier, um, the, um, the Docker webinar that I created. All right, so I'm, I'm just doing a git clone of it. I already did a git clone. Um, I need to get clone of it. And right now at this point, I'm ready to actually run my app. Um, I, the workflow that I wanted to show is like the changes that we make and then how it gets uh, pushed to the uh, registry. Um, yeah, maybe I just say to welcome to... I created a new branch. I'm committing to uh, 
to the branch Right. So I push to the uh, to our GitHub Enterprise. You can see the pull request is ready. Um, typically, this is not. It's recommended that you don't merge your own pull request. But again, for this demo, I'm going to merge my own pull request. There is a system that we have internally as well that will flag if you try to merge your own pull request. Um, so again, for the demo purposes, I'm doing this is not what's recommended, and don't merge your own pull request. So I, I created a pull request and I'm going to merge myself. Again, as I mentioned, we have, um, th this should have triggered the build that you can see here, um, right? So you can see the webhook already triggered the build. Um, it, it may take a few minutes, yeah. Uh, then I'll go back here to our registry. Um, Oh, there is an error. <laughs> Looks like something is wrong, either at the uh, load balancer level or something. Uh, shit. Yeah. Uh, we have to take a look at it. Sorry, guys, I couldn't show it. Uh, <laughs> Um, no but in general, can, all, man. <laughs> yeah. But you can see in this case where the same uh, process that we I pushed it to the registry, and then once uh, sorry pushed to our branch, and then once I pushed to the branch, it actually uh, created the Docker image um, on the local box. Once the Docker image has been created, it got pushed to the um, to the Docker registry under this pattern. Uh, like under the library uh, folder, uh, library slash Docker webinar web uh, registry, and then at that point it is available for us to use. Um, and and typically it takes about two minutes. Um, no, it actually took even less because I think this is something that I've been trying. Um, but but you can see that it takes very less time for us to create the image and start pushing. And as, as I mentioned earlier, we follow this uh, where we use this particular um, Docker image. Um, sorry. Hey, Kaldub, I think you, I think the screen might have froze a little bit, unless it's just my screen. I don't know if anyone in the audience, if you guys can see fine, let me know. Is it still not working? Um, no, I'm right now. I think it's stuck on the Jenkins. Um, and your Jenkins instance. Oh. So maybe if you can unshare your screen and then reshare it, that might fix the issue. I think we might have lost Cold Deep real quick. So let's give him just a couple of seconds to jump back on here. Hello? Yep, I can hear you again. Okay, I was on mute, I think. Somehow I got <laughs> mute again. Um, uh, what I was trying to say earlier is where um, as mo all the Docker Images use the ExpressJS uh, base uh, Docker image. As as like as we start to have more and more ExpressJS apps, this image is already there on the box, right? Like there is nothing that we the Docker uh, the Jenkins slaves have already pulled it down. So all we have to do is basically um, the 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 copy part and running npm install, and it depends on how big the uh, your package.json is. And after that point, the Docker image is available for you to use, and then from there, uh, you can start using your Docker image and um, deploy to any environment that you want. 
we deploy the same like not all apps get deployed both to our data center and in AWS. Some of them they do and some of them they don't. Um, uh, for the apps that get deployed in data center and AWS, we have a uh, Jenkins pipeline which goes and calls deployments to our data center and deployments to AWS and using the same Docker uh, image. Yes, sorry, I couldn't show the uh, like it it fully working. Unfortunately, I don't know something went wrong. I have to check the network. Um, but in general, that's the process that we follow. Like we check into the repo, and then a build gets figured, and then the the build actually creates the image, and then it pushes to our uh, registry. Okay. Um, let me stop sharing my screen. And maybe we can go back to the uh, slides, um, Chris. All right, here we are. Okay. Yeah, maybe. Sorry, can you can you make me a presenter again? I just retried, and it is it does seem to work. Um, just sure. want to finish it off. Absolutely. Give me one second. All right, I've given you privileges. Yes. Right, so here you can see that right now I just re-triggered it for some reason. It did not work the first one. Um, I, I triggered it back again, just I did a rebuild. And then you can see that it created the Docker image here. Then now it is uh, preparing to uh, push, and then it will. Uh, once it is pushed, you sh we should see a um, because all of these the layers, as I mentioned, are the same. It's just the last part that's um, uh, different. So you should see a new version here. Show up the tag, right? So this is the version that was created right now. Um, you can see this. This is the version, right? Like the eight four four. Um, is the version that was pushed. So that's that's our typical CI/CD workflow with Docker Trust Registry. As as people start pushing more and more, every change that gets pushed to the master, um, you see an image for that. Then we have a lot of tags. Then we have we have a cleanup job that we go and um, delete the uh, not used uh, Docker images from the registry. Um, but that's a job that we run on a schedule. It's not an event driven. I think as um, Chris mentioned earlier, that's where garbage collection comes into help where you want to delete from the memory, then you use the garbage collection turned on. Um, so not sure why the first one did not go, but hopefully it worked this time and then I can see it working. Um, yeah, I think we can go back to the slides and then I'll wrap it up. Chris. Sure, I'm glad you're able to get it to work, man. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that usually happens, but some reason it's <laughs> It was meant to be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, let me reshare these. Uh, okay, you should be able to see it. Okay. Yeah, of course, as, as I mentioned earlier as well, again, the LDAP integration is not something that we like. And then uh, one place where we can store our images where we can distribute them between our data center and our AWS. We don't have to replicate them into every environment. Um, definitely, we have uh, cost savings around it. Um, um, again, as I mentioned multiple times today, is about portability, where I can use it from a local laptop into my data centers, into AWS different environments that we have. Uh, and, and also, one thing that I like with the trust registry, it gives a visualization of a few and a half minutes shows your current status, how your different Docker uh, regist uh, Docker registry components are working. And uh, recently we also, I think, maybe I'm not sure if Chris mentioned this about logging. Uh, I think he did mention. So he, the logging is also really helpful. You know, what we do is we get the, the logs that are written for the trusted registry and then we pipe them out to Splunk. So we, we manage like the 30-day uh, logs of the Docker Trusted Registry. 
So if someone wants to go and do an audit or scan our uh, trusted registry, um, we do have all that logs. So we retain them by sending the logs out to Splunk. And then you get logs at different layers. But you get the log at the load balancer level that the registry has, and you know, even at the image layers as well. See, there are two, I think, two containers that make the Docker trusted registry for the image part. So, but again, the logging is turned on on all the layers, and then we send those into Splunk for us to go and do any kind of audit logs on or whatnot. Uh, next slide. Yeah, okay, so this is where we jump, but yeah. Um, our, our journey with Docker, like I would say, not at the beginning, but definitely more than beginning. Um, as I mentioned, we have about 200 apps that are running in production already, uh, but it, it will go grow as we continue to, um, trying to either running in our data center, either running in AWS, um, that's where we are seeing Docker's benefit with it, the portability. So you continue to push more and more images to uh, a Docker trust registry. We are looking at signing our images um, with uh, DTR or content uh, content trust. Um, and as we start to more and more deploy uh, our apps workloads using Docker, of course we have to need uh, need to run more Docker uh, engines as well. Uh, you just like. My closing uh, mention in this uh, webinar is again, Docker Trusted Registry is definitely helping us to have a way we can share our images in every location that we are, we are deploying our applications. You have authentication that's turned on, you have authorization, then you have definitely logging enabled um, so that when you want to do any kind of audits or uh, anything at your registry, you can definitely do that. And we are definitely invested in Docker long term, so we are continue to start. We will continue to use Docker, test registry, and uh, so on. Uh, I think that's all that I had. Awesome, thank you, Colby, so much for the demo. I'm so happy um, you got it to work. Um, it seemed like maybe it was just meant to be, right? Um, thank you so much for first off using Docker Trusted Registry and, and agreeing to come in and tell your story about how you're using it at Expedia. So secondly, I want to thank every one of you for being here and listening to myself and Colleeb talk about this. Um, again, this presentation has been recorded, so I'll follow up with you and send this out to you later on today. I see a, a couple questions have come in. So um, one question is um, for you, Colleeb, um, are the base images preloaded to DTR or are they built on requests from Primer and stored in DTR? Um, so. Uh, the base images, um, the, do the Docker uh, repo, uh, we have a, uh, like we have a shell script build.sh, which basically all the base images that we have, um, they are all like let's say you want to change the Express.js app tomorrow, you want to add a new um, let's say library or something that you want to add into the base Docker image, you make the change, you push it to the uh, Docker uh, repo. And then the, there is a Jenkins job which actually pushes the doc, the base images as well. Um, with respect to the application repos, um, as soon as you create, it's actually triggering the same workflow that I showed, right? Um, because I have triggered, I have committed a change to the master. The Jenkins job gets kicked in. Uh, the master job will run, and then it will generate the image, and then it pushes to uh, to the registry. So the application repos or even the base Docker images are definitely done through an event-driven architecture where it is using the webhooks to create. Uh, again, I can go and run the job on a periodic schedule, but doesn't, that doesn't really help me if I don't follow a CICD process. And Kolib, um I guess I'll, take, I'll ask this last question. Just um, what do you see or what advice do you have for other enterprise companies who are looking to get started with Docker or, you know, what's your kind of like big nug of advice for an enterprise who's looking at Docker and some of the value that you've seen? Um, again, uh, biggest benefit that I've seen, um, as I mentioned earlier as well, was 
the, the portability between different environments and when I say different environments actually your local laptop as well right so it could be even a app that's a monolith application which like you are just copying bits in and around from different sources and then just running a command to start your application even with that level of uh, not not I'm not talking even like the microservices or even serverless architectures, but let's say you have a big monolith application. The benefit of running the same the same way that you can run your application in different environments that's the biggest plus that I see. And and the time it takes to uh, run your Docker image basically if you have like if you have laid your Docker images properly where you are only recreating new and new Docker images when like at the last part of your Docker file, let's say uh, you are only copying the bits at the end rather than if you copy the bits at the first lay line in the Docker file, then every time that you make a change, the whole image gets generated. Sorry, the whole the, the, the layers again get all all the layers get regenerated. I think that's the other advice that I have is to be careful on how you author your Docker files. Um, then, then also try to follow a layered approach. The portability is where definitely it wins, and then the speed to, I won't say speed to market, but speed to actually deploy your applications that um, once you have a proper architecture layer, and you want to redeploy a new version of your application, because the most of the layer is already there on the balls, it takes few seconds for your application to start up versus you have to install uh, like Java, or whatever it is, in, 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 with the other deployment tools out there. Um, so that's where I think the time to get your app running in production or in any environment is considerably less. Any other questions or? Hello? Yep, sorry, I was on mute. So we do have a question Hello. from from Will. Um, I do want to be respectful of your time and everyone else's time, so um, I'll, cl I'll ask one more question. Um, so if a base image is updated, um, do the child images automatically rebuild within your environment, Kuldeep? Uh No, we, we, it's not, unless there is a security patch that we want to apply, um, we haven't got we haven't gone that route yet because we want to keep it like whatever version was the app generated with we want that to be the same right we don't want them to be uh, that's the reason you you don't see that we are using like latest approach if we are using latest for our uh, like in the in the child uh, uh, docker files then yeah if I change the latest then when I like let's say the Docker container runs on a host today, but goes and runs on a different host tomorrow. Then you have two different versions of the Docker image on the same box. So definitely, we are not looking at that uh, pattern for sure. Unless there is a security patch, that's a totally different thing where we have to go and patch. But typically, we want the image that was generated for that version to be the same across all environments. Even though if there is a change in the uh, top layer. We want it to be versioned so that tomorrow when you want to change, like say the Node.js one, you would put 1.1.0 uh, rather than always having 1.0.0. Awesome, thank you so much, Kaldeep. So I guess at this point what I'll do is I'll close up. All right, so thank you to Kaldeep so much for being here, man. Uh, it means a lot to us here at Docker and uh, we're glad that we're able to work with you and Expedia. Thanks a lot, Chris. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you, and thank you, everyone, for being here, spending the last hour or so to, uh, to hear from us. We appreciate it, and we look forward to having you join our future webinars. And right, have a great remainder of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Philippe. Yep, thanks, Philippe.